meeting, gavel. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Thank you all for coming. Uh, tonight we're going to be holding uh, two public hearings. Uh, the first one is on privately initiated Metro Plan Amendment and Willikinsey Area Plan Amendment. It's uh, intended to looking at changing the plan designation on subject property from campus industrial to light medium industrial with concurrent zone change from E1 campus employment to E2 mixed use employment for the subject property. Um, we'll start with this public hearing and then I'll kind of talk about the other one. Uh, I'm Tiffany Edwards, uh, chair of the Eugene Planning Commission. And uh, to start, I'm gonna just go around and let each of our commissioners uh, just introduce themselves. So let's see, I'll call on you because that makes it a little, little easier. So let's start with Commissioner Beeson. I'm Ken Beeson. Great, great, thank you. Uh, and then we'll go to Commissioner Fragla. Good evening, My, I am Commissioner Lisa Fragla. Perfect. I'm really just testing your ability to mute and unmute yourself. So uh, how about John, Commissioner Brosky? Uh, John Borowski. All right, and then our newest uh, member of the commission, Dan Isaacson. Hello, everyone. Dan Isaacson, commissioner. All right, and then uh, last but not least, from the planning commission, we have Commissioner Ramey. Good evening. I'm Chris Ramey. Welcome, everybody. Um, we also have some staff members, so I'll just go through and, and just let them identify each of themselves. So we have Jeff Gepper, senior planner. Hi, everyone. Good evening. And then we have Gabe Flock, our principal planner. Good evening. And Alyssa Hansen, our planning director. Good evening. Perfect. All right. So I just want to take a moment to explain who the planning commission is and our, our specific role. Um, so we are unpaid volunteers and we're appointed by the Eugene City Council to four year terms uh, on the commission. The commission often makes recommendations to the city council on legislative matters, such as plan amendments and adoption of new land use regulations. But we also hear appeals of decisions made by sitting city hearings official and tonight's hearing is for an application for a site-specific Metro Plan Amendment, Refinement Plan Amendment, and Zone Change, which staff will briefly summarize before we take uh, begin taking testimony. So the Planning Commission's role in this process is to, we make a recommendation to the Eugene City Council on whether to approve, to approve with modifications, or to deny the application. So that is that is our role. Uh, the Eugene City Council makes all the final decisions in this in this case. Um, some of the terms we have to use are legalistic. So I'll try to explain the requirements in plain English as best as I can. And then since this hearing is for a site specific application, there are unique procedures which we are legally required to follow. The decision making process for this application is considered quasi judicial. So we'll use quasi-judicial format for this public hearing. Before we begin, the Eugene Code also requires that the planning commissioners disclose any conflicts of interest, ex parte contacts, biases, or abstentions. In a quasi-judicial proceeding, the parties are entitled to impartial or neutral decision maker. To ensure this fair consideration, the Eugene Code and the Planning Commission's rules attempt to limit ex parte contacts or communications between the party and the decision maker outside the public hearing process. Each Planning Commissioner must disclose and describe the substance of any communication they've had about this application outside the public process. The Planning Commissioners must also disclose any conflicts of interest, that is whether the decision they're about to make could result in personal financial gain or loss for themselves, their relatives, a, a, or business uh, with which the commissioner or commissioner's relative is associated. And then finally, a planning commissioner cannot participate if he or she is biased. So that is for whatever reason, he or she is incapable of making an objective decision for these applications. Uh, so I will ask if any commissioners have anything to disclose to start off. All right, so I actually do have an ex parte communication that I just want to disclose. I'm just going to read a statement here. 
I'd like to state that since the application was officially submitted, uh, I've had conversations with Anne-Marie Levis about this ap application. Uh, Anne-Marie's agency, Funk Levis, represents the applicant, Shepherd Motors, and has been uh, highly involved in this process. In my former role with the Eugene Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, I led the advo business advocacy efforts. And uh, in that role, I was involved in coordinating and arranging se several presentations and correspondences for some of our members um, and the, the applicant. Now, I am no longer with the chamber. And because of that, Anne-Marie Levis more recently reached out asking some advice on the best way to engage the chamber uh, to seek support for the application. And I suggested that she contact the chamber's CEO. Um, so I wanna just make sure folks understand my role in all of that. Um, but I will say that I can affirm that I can absolutely make an unbiased recommendation on this application and that my recommendation will be based solely on the applicable approval criteria and the evidence and argument in the record. Um, also I'd like to note that any person during uh, his or her testimony has the right to rebut the substance of the ex parte communications that I've just disclosed. All right, so it doesn't sound like we have any other commissioners to disclose anything. Um, I, I then have to ask if anybody in the audience or a member of the commission, and if and if you do, please, if you could, um, just raise your hand, have uh, a, a desire to challenge the impartiality of any of our planning commissioners. And I'm gonna rely on staff to tell me if we've got any hands raised here. Okay. Not seeing any hands raised. Okay, so seeing none, um, I'll, I'll keep moving on through my script. Um, the purpose of the hearing is to receive relevant testimony on the applications before us. So I wanna remind everybody that your testimony should be directed toward the approval criteria that you believe apply to these applications. We ask you to frame your testimony in terms of the applicable approval criteria because the Eugene Code requires that our recommendation be based on those approval criteria. For reference, the applicable cr approval criteria are listed in the application narrative that was prepared as part of the staff report. Bear with me, I have a few more pages to go. Uh, so those wishing to speak during the public hearing will be asked to virtually raise your hand, and there are different ways to raise your hand um, depending on how you're participating. If you're joining us on a computer or tablet or smart device, you can raise your hand by clicking the blue hand icon at the bottom of the screen or by opening um, the participant window. If you're joining by phone, you can dial star nine, after which you should hear an audio confirmation of your hand being raised. And then if you wish to speak and have not already raised your hand, go ahead and do so now when staff will be tracking the recording. Traditionally, once the public hearing is open, speakers uh, are called in the following order. Number one is those in support. Number two would be those neutral and number three for those who are opposed. However, due to the limitations of the virtual hearing platform, we have had to make some adjustments. So the applicant will be the first to speak, and then following the applicant's presentation, testimony will be received in the order that the interested parties have requested to speak. As we're unable to fill out a request to speak form, all interested parties providing testimony will be asked to begin by clearly stating their name, address and whether they are in support, neutral or opposition to the application. The, ap the applicant will have the opportunity to present first and then each member of the public giving testimony after that will have at least three minutes to speak. We don't have a visual timer. So if you continue to speak beyond uh, a reasonable allotted time, I may just interject and, and ask you to wrap up. And once your time's up, your audio may be muted <laughs> to allow other interested parties to to, to speak. Um, following the public testimony, then city staff will have the opportunity to respond to the testimony provided and answer any questions that may come up. And then finally, the applicant will be given the opportunity for a final rebuttal. I know commissioners have asked for more clarity on when it's appropriate to ask questions and staff suggested that if you have questions about someone's testimony, 
go ahead and ask those questions following those individuals' testimony. So if you have um, commissioners, when you're listening to testimony, raise your hand, I can see that, and, and then we'll, we'll let you respond to that and ask some questions if you have them. And then I'm also uh, wanna remind everybody that the failure to raise an issue with sufficient specificity to allow the planning uh, commission and parties to respond will preclude future appeals on that issue. So in other words, now is your opportunity to raise issues as clearly as you can so that the city and other parties can address them. And then just as a reminder, um, the Planning Commission does not make a final decision on these applications. We will be making uh, a recommendation to City Council and they will have their own public hearing and allow their own set of new evidence um, before making any final decisions. So with that, we're gonna start with a staff, staff presentation and then I will move to opening up a public hearing. So I'll go ahead and kick it off. I believe Jeff is going to talk to us about uh, this this application. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so once again, my name is Jeff Kepper. I'm a senior planner here at the city. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Uh, just prepared a brief presentation regarding tonight's application, which is uh, Shepherd Motors. And I always put it in parentheses, Eugene Audi because Shepard Motors does have other companies and I wanted to specify that this is for this project. Um, tonight we are dealing with a Metro Plan Amendment, a Refinement Plan Amendment and Zone Change. Um, I'll get into those in a little more detail here once it goes forward. So just so we know what we're talking about, we're in the far northeast of town, um, just Northwest of where the uh, where I five and Beltline are, so it's um, a large sixteen point seven two acre parcel uh, just between Old Covert Road and I five, um, right right along North Game Farm Road. That's where the UGB runs. So um, this is an undeveloped piece of property. It actually consists of five tax lots. Um, those five tax lots are owned by different individual groups. Uh, the applicant, Shepherd Motors LLC, has received permission from each one of those parties to apply on their behalf. So moving on. Um, firstly, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the applicant discusses and talks about. And um, they're proposing to develop uh, and the Eugene Audi Automotive uh, Sales and Service Center um, at this location. And part of that application is also installing electric vehicle charging stations um, that are accessory to their, their auto dealership. Um, as you can see, I, I took a snippet of the uh, the permitted use table here for the employment zone. You can see that motor vehicle sales, rental and services are not permitted within the E1 zone, which is the current zoning on the property, uh, which is why they're applying for this project or this uh, these applications. So there's kind of, there's three applications tonight. It's a suite of different ones. And so we're, we're looking at essentially two different kind of pieces. One of which is the plan diagram amendment. So that's the plan diagram amendment as well as the Willa Kenzie area plan. They both have the same designations currently, which are campus industrial, uh, and we will only be moving to light uh, medium industrial for those uh, two plans. And I'll get a little bit more into that in a minute. And then the zone change would be changing the zone from uh, E1 campus employment to E2 mixed use employment. So here I took, uh, I tried to blow up the Metro plan just as a, a note, the official Metro plan is the 11 by 17 as adopted, but this is just for everybody's ease of reference. Uh, here, I don't know if you can see my little hand and cursor on the screen, but um, right in this yellow circle, that's approximately where the subject property is. Uh, the hash marked blue area, that's the campus industrial designation. And then um, the, the tan box that's right next to that, that's actually the Stonebridge Apartments, which you saw this property kind of wraps itself around. And so the Stonebridge Apartments actually back in 2006, uh, they changed from campus industrial to uh, medium uh, residential. So that's, so for this change to the Metro plan, they would be for the subject property, which kind of wraps around that corner there they would be changing that to light, medium, industrial. 
And the reason being is that the their proposed zone um, is not consistent with the campus industrial. So they would need that light medium uh, zone uh, designation. Tiffany. I just want to ask a quick question. What is the pink and the brown, are those other zones? And if so, what are those? So those, those land use designations um, over here, that's commercial uh, in the pink. And then um, up here, I believe brown is actually agricultural because that's the, okay. uh, um, the residential. And so the property is primarily surrounded by um, the campus industrial to as far as that goes um, with the Remember, this is I-5, so there's a pretty big separation between uh, that commercial and where this is proposed. Um, here's a snippet of the Willa Kenzie area plan diagram. So once again, we're looking at these properties here. You can see that the change to medium density uh, residential is not actually reflected on this diagram here. Um, that would be these kind of three parcels here. And then this is the subject property things have kind of changed a little bit since this plan diagram was made, but those would be changed to um, the light, medium, industrial category. And then as far as the proposed zoning, um, here you can see that the existing zoning, we've got R2, where the Stonebridge apartments are. Um, up in the far corner, we have R1, and then across the street on Game Farm, that's county land, it's agricultural. Um, and then E1 pretty much surround is uh, the remaining portions out in this area. And they would be proposing the, the change you see here, which would be going to the E2 uh, zoning category. So um, just really quickly, kind of as an overview for folks watching, uh, how these three plans kind of relate is that the Metro plan is kind of, it's our big, a uh, long-term document, it gives us kind of the guiding principles that we work by and the, the land use designation map is how we uh, look, when we look at zone changes as things they have to be consistent with that. Um, the refinement plan adds another layer of refinement where it adds, you know, some more specific policies, goes into greater detail, uh, more nuances associated with each area. And then the zoning is literally the implementation tool that implements those guiding policies. So. Um, that's kind of how they all relate. And now I'm going to get a little bit down into the weeds as to how these three applications kind of play off each other. So, like I said, the whole reason we're seeing this week of applications is because the Metro plan and met the zone change they would like isn't consistent with the Metro plan. And so in order to do that zone change, they need to amend the Metro plan. And so they applied for a type one Metro plan amendment, which essentially means that we're only amending the, uh, the, the plan diagram itself. We're not amending any text, we're not amending anything like that. It's only the plan diagram that we're changing. And as part of that, uh, there's a provision in the Metro plan procedures that says anytime that it's a change to the Metro plan diagram, such as this one, um, the refinement plan can, will automatically be changed uh, when no other changes to the, the refinement plan are needed. And essentially, you can look at that. The reason for that automatic nature and this, this provision is that um, the refinement plan must remain consistent with the metro plan because the metro plan would override the refinement plan anyway. So it doesn't make sense to have uh, to, to the refinement plan to be in conflict with the metro plan um, so here we're, we're this automatic system is just set in place to to kind of carry that the refinement plan along so um, and then finally the zone change uh, is really the zone change is contingent upon the actual metro plan going through and I'll, I'll get down into that a little bit later with each of the approval criteria but the reason being is that the zone change needs to be supported by the metro plan any questions on that? That's a fun topic. Um, I have a really quick question. I just yeah, wondered, the, the, uh, the refinement plan or the Willa Kenzie plan seems mm -hmm. to indicate that the R1 and R2 was more of a recent uh, zone change. Is that correct or no? Uh, do you mean the, the E1, E2? Well, no, the residential there that it, I think it, you were saying that the 
that the plan didn't reflect that she, that that had. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So when they did, when they went through that, um, so here I'll, I'll go back up really quick to show everyone. So here, yeah, right there. You see the R2 there, and we yeah. got the R2 here. Uh, the reason is that that was such a small amendment. They didn't go through the process of actually, they adopted the ordinance to make the change, but they didn't necessarily draw a whole new map for it. Um, okay. So that's the only reason why. This was the only color version I could find of this map. So that's the only reason why. And it was done in 2006. And so this this uh, Willow Kenzie area plan was updated as of 2003, which is why that's not okay. uh, reflecting that. Um, any other questions related to those? The different plan any related questions, to anybody? Okay. I don't yeah. see them. Um, so moving on into the actual, looking at the approval criteria, and here's where I really briefly I want to talk about the fact that I... When, when we're reviewing these types of applications, I while Shepherd Motors did a great job talking about their Eugene Audi project, um, we look at it from the perspective of, are they meeting the approval criteria based on those zones, not the proposed use? Because it's not that proposed use might not necessarily happen. So we want to make sure that we're looking at it in a bit, a bit of a more holistic picture. Um, so when we reviewed this uh, in the preliminary findings you see in attachment C of the, of the staff report, we don't really go, we don't go into great detail analyzing the auto dealership. We go into an analysis of whether this is actually consistent with the approval criteria, um, looking at the uses as a whole. So um, the first criteria for the Metro Plan Amendment is going into the statewide planning goals and saying, are they consistent with those? For the most part, they either don't apply or won't affect the statewide planning goals. The only two that really are impacted are goal nine, which is the economic development component. And the important thing to look at here is the fact that uh, goal nine requires us to look at if we're impacting our the availability of employment lands and industrial lands within the within our UGV. And in this case, uh, campus, like all the employment and industrial lands are actually sitting in one bucket within that employment land study. So by going from campus industrial to uh, mixed or uh, to um, light medium industrial, you're not technically making it, uh, you're just going from one to one. So we're not impacting the employment land study that way. Um, and then looking at goal 12, it's about transportation and uh, the applicant recognizes that there's transportation um, issues in this area. And so they hired a uh, transportation engineer, Chris Clameau, to do an analysis. And um, they actually proposed what is a trip cap for this project. And so you'll see that as a condition, as part of my recommendation. Um, but essentially what it means is that they placed a trip cap, or they proposed a trip cap that would limit them to the maximum number of trips that would be allowed at a fully developed site in the E1 zone. So what, it, or what it's currently at, as opposed to the maximum build out in the E2. So that trip cap essentially takes away any guessing as to what the impacts would be by, by making this change. And it just says, we're gonna limit ourselves to what it is now and just mitigate those, those impacts now through that measure. Um, so that's kind of what the transportation planning rule uh, is all about. It's looking about those potential impacts um, on our network from a change like this. Okay. So Jeff, I do have a question from Commissioner Borofsky who has his hand raised. Yeah, please. Um, thank you. I just have a question about... Um, didn't when we did the employment and industrial land part of the comp plan, didn't we land that and then get that adopted into our comprehensive plan? So once once it's in our comp plan, how come we have to amend the metro plan? If if I thought the whole idea was once we got our comp plan and approved sections of the comp plan, the metro plan would no longer apply to that area. Can you explain that to me? 
Yeah, absolutely. So you're entirely correct that the economic development portion of the Metro plan in terms of the policies and guidelines don't doesn't apply anymore. It's Envision Eugene's section that applies. Here, the reason that this Metro plan amendment is necessary is because the Metro plan diagram is still the only land use diagram and the zone change requires consistency with the Metro plan. And so we're not, so actually it's an important distinction um, with the fact that uh, the applicant doesn't reference consistency with any of the Metro plan policies for economic development. It only talks about consistency with the Envision Eugene economic development components. And you'll actually see that in um, on, on the third approval criterion, it actually talks about consistency with Envision Eugene. And you'll see that's where we talk about the employment land study as well as the policies from the economic development section. So you're, so you're correct um, in that. So, so and, and again, this is kind of goes a little bit past this, but so we won't be able to use our comp plan for this type of thing until we get the parcel specific uh, zone zone designation is that is that seem right but uh, yeah until we gave you on jump in well sure I, i'd be happy to answer that so we um, are still reliant on a significant portion of the existing metro plan right so with the adoption of envision eugene that included uh as you say landing the uh or adopting the the buildable lands inventory citywide right uh, we also developed and adopted the economic chapter, right, which is relevant in this case because it does relate to employment lands. Uh, but there are significant portions of the Metro plan, including the plan diagram, that have not been fully amended or brought into the Envision Eugene comprehensive plan as a parcel specific diagram. We intend to do that work in the future, but we're in this middle place currently where uh, you know, we, we rely partly on Envision Eugene for buildable lands and economic development policies, but the Metro plan for plan designations. So until such time as that um, parcel specific diagram comes forward, we will continue to rely on the Metro plan diagram. Thank you for and, that clarification. And just to be, uh, just to reiterate one more point um, with regard to the buildable lands inventory, Jeff touched on this is that we are changing from one type of industrial to another, but because those are lumped together within the adopted billable lands inventory, there is no amendment or a net change to the to the um, the, the land bank, if you will, of available industrial land. Okay, thank you. So I, I do also have Commissioner Beeson with his hand up. Commissioner, go ahead and ask your question. So I don't want to go too far into detail here, uh, but you did you did bring up the trip cap. Um, I was trying to think through that as I read through the material. I guess my question is uh, to use a to propose a trip cap based upon the zoning that's not going to exist if all of this gets approved. Um, I was kind of confused why they would do that. I understand this particular development may not happen. You're looking at conditions for the, the, the zoning to make this change. I'm kind of assuming uh, if they decide to go through with this after the approvals are in place, they'd have to do a TIA at that time for the specific development. But I can you tell me why, why wouldn't you come up with a worst case trip cap for E2? There we go. Um, so the as part of the TPR, essentially what they what they've done is avoid the need to go through that full analysis and and therefore potentially the need to mitigate those impacts of of the increased usage that can come from a max build out of the E2. And so what they've done is they uh, and I'll let the applicant speak a little bit more to this, but um, I would assume that by proposing this, they recognize that their intended use is not going to go above that trip cap that they've set at the maximum build out. And so what by doing so, they essentially have given themselves the option to build up to that. And then what we've done is we actually added the section that gives them the opportunity to 
uh, meet the transportation planning rule by going through a type two process that would allow them to, to change that trip cap over time. And so um, I'll just scroll down really quickly to that, that recommended condition here. And so essentially you see the first part, they say that they're limiting that to the max build out. And, and then we give them um, the option to, to change that if, uh, let's say this doesn't happen and a new use comes in that does want to build out to the full capacity of the E2, at that time, that new development will have to uh, provide analysis that proves consistency with the state transportation planning rule. Does that okay. answer? Okay. I, yeah, I think all I really, yeah, just wanted to clarify, uh, if the development proceeds, they would need to show that they're within that cap or they'll have to do a TIA at that time, right? Correct, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yep. Great, so um, uh, the only other thing that I haven't really touched here is as far as the Metro plan goes is it doesn't make the Metro plan internally inconsistent. So like uh, in this case, we didn't find any policies or anything that would um, uh, not allow this to, to move forward. So uh, moving on to the refinement plan. So while this was automatic and, and triggered through the Metro plan amendment, uh, we did make findings for the approval criteria and for the um, first set, it's essentially demonstrating consistency with the things that we've already talked about in uh, the Metro plan amendment itself. And um, lastly, this, this amendment is in response to the change in the Metro plan. So we found that they met those approval criteria as well. And then lastly, looking at the actual zone change, um, like I said, this is where the, the, the whole reason this application, this suite of applications exists is because uh, the first criterion for a zone change is for being consistent with the Metro plan. And so, like I said, this for, uh, basically this first criterion is contingent upon the Metro plan and refinement plan being approved. Um, so those, if those are approved, uh, the first two criterions have been met. And then we already talked about the transportation planning rule, which they've satisfied by doing the condition. They're served by key urban facilities as noted in my findings. And the siting requirements basically only require that they abut an arterial road, which North Game Farm is a minor arterial. Um, so based on that, uh, staff recommends that the planning commission recommend approval uh, of the requested Metro plan amendment uh, the refinement plan amendment and zone change subject to that trip cap condition. Um, one thing uh, I did want to mention just as a note uh, that of something that I've added into the record for uh, just to assist in this analysis for the planning commission. So I'll provide this to you. I literally finished it right before our meeting tonight. Um, I went through the use table and basically identified what the potential changes would result in. Um, so here, um, starting on page two, you'll see all the, the, all the uses in the employment land zone. So here's uh, it's E1 and E2. Um, and then yellow would mean, for example, a change in um, the special use limitations. And then um, green would mean something that went, you can see here for E1, it was not permitted and now it's permitted outright. So this was just a tool that I wanted to provide to the planning commission after um, discussions yesterday that would help everyone kind of navigate the what this potential change would mean in terms of the uses allowed in that zone if Audi doesn't actually um, move forward with their proposal. So Jeff, I think that's extremely helpful and I appreciate that because I know I had asked about that. I'm wondering if this is something that you can you can uh, include in the record and make sure that we have access to that as we're going yeah, to. Yeah, I, I literally printed out and added it to the record uh, about okay. five before the meeting tonight. So I appreciate your patience with me getting that in there and um, hopefully it'll uh, be helpful during deliberations. Yeah, thanks for your work on that. Appreciate it. Um, and with that, based on the, the recommendation and, and that information, um, I will hand it back to you. Okay, sorry, I'm playing with my mute button here. Okay, so moving on. So I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing of the Eugene Planning Commission. If you would like to speak and have not already raised your hand, please do raise your virtual hand now. Um, if you're on a phone, you can do the star nine. And uh, please, we encourage you to submit any written testimony that you may have as well. Um, and I'm going to have city staff, I think Amy is manning here. Uh, she'll be announcing the first person to give testimony will, of course, be the applicant um, or the applicant's representative. And then she'll, I'll have her kind of manage that as we go. So um, as a reminder, please begin by stating your full name, your address, and whether you are in support, neutral, or opposed to this application. So Amy, uh, why don't we go ahead and call our applicant? We have Tim Brunner. Brunner. Perfect. Right. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Tim. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. <laughs> um, actually, what I'd like to do is have Phil Spears uh, start, if that would be okay. Yes, that's no problem. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, Phil. Okay, thank you. My name is Phil Spears. I reside at 3689 Marcella Drive in Eugene, Oregon, 97408. I'm the president and owner of Shepherd Motors, uh, the third generation of a family business that's been serving Eugene for the last 70 years. And we've also lived in the Gillum neighborhood for the last uh, 20 years. So. I'd like to thank uh, everybody on staff for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, speak tonight. Wanted to introduce my team. Uh, we worked hard to assemble a team with experience in planning this project to ensure that we met the city of Eugene planning and land use goals. Uh, Anne-Marie Lovis is dedicated community volunteer and businesswoman. Uh, she was a planning commissioner for 11 and a half years and is currently a 4J board member. Mike Reeder is a Eugene attorney who practices land use law locally and throughout the state of Oregon. Tim Brunner uh, with Access Design and is an architect and also has experience in land use. And Chris Clameau uh, is a transportation engineer that helped us understand the implications on Game Farm Road. Uh, the path to out of Eugene uh, started about 15 years ago when I made contact with them and uh, asked them if they were interested in coming to Eugene. And, and at that point they weren't, but over the course of time we stayed in contact and on August 1st, 2018, we received a formal letter that Audi would be evaluating dealers for the franchise in Eugene. Uh, there were 10 applicants, uh, which was narrowed down to three, uh, and we were allowed to come down to California and present in person. Uh, and then we also hosted them um, uh, a number of times in Eugene. Uh, on May uh, 1st, 2019, we were awarded the franchise and I'll quote, uh, Audi chose Shepherd Motors over the other dealers because they wanted someone who was locally owned and operated and connected to the community. Uh, with that, we investigated multiple locations for the franchise and of the various locations considered, the Game Farm Road property was determined to be ideal due to its proximity, visibility to the freeway and access for customers uh, coming in on I-5. Um, additionally, uh, customers currently have to travel over 200 miles round trip, either up to Wilsonville over to Bend uh, to service their Audis. And there are currently 1,200 Audi customers in Eugene Springfield. And so with that, we did meet with the planning uh, division staff last summer on site to discuss the feasibility of the particular location. Uh, we also had uh, two meetings with the Northeast Neighborhood Association and received positive feedback. Uh, and also assessed and looked at the community impact. Uh, we, will, we feel that the facility will be aesthetically pleasing. It will be a buffer between the freeway overpass and the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, and we're also making a commitment to enhance the area, uh, support electric vehicles. Uh, Audi is planning on 25% of its vehicles in 2025 to be electric, and we are gonna be in support of that. Uh, and then also we're gonna be adding 30 new high paying skilled jobs where we will provide a 401k, uh, health, life, disability insurance, and a profit share. Uh, our culture at Shepherd Motors is to support our team through personal and professional growth, through education and advancement. And so we're excited about the opportunity. Uh, now with that, I'll turn it over to Tim and, and he can go through any of the technical aspects that, uh, that, uh, that need to be reviewed. Thank you. Perfect, thanks Phil. 
Go ahead, Tim. Great, thank you. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank staff and planning commissioners again for having us uh, this evening. I just wanted to point out that this process, although we're doing quite a uh, several changes here that we're requesting, the process has been very straightforward and clear uh, due to staff's professionalism and thoroughness. And so thank you very much for that. Um, on behalf of Phil, Brad, and Shepard Motors team, uh, we just happily support the staff decision of this application. Uh, we've done our hardest to uh, be proactive, uh, involve the community uh, and neighbors, multiple meetings that we hosted um, to kind of clarify what we are doing, which I think once they understood, especially with regards to traffic and that trip cap that we're proposing, uh, we were going to be actually a very good neighbor for them because it would be much less traffic associated with the property than what could be currently developed under the current zoning. Um, I just wanted to briefly explain a little bit about the site, and I don't know, Jeff, if you can pull up my diagram. Quiet, awkward, dead space. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So what you're going to see is this is the current uh, zoning diagram. I want to point out a couple of things with this site that make it uh, very nice for um, this particular location. One thing I want to point out is and one of the goals uh, is to try to utilize properties that are either public and or utilities for development. In this particular site, uh, three of the properties are owned by, one by eWeb has an easement through the middle, um, Northwest Natural and ODOT. And we've reached out and worked with them. Uh, Phil has done a great job working with those uh, utilities and ODOT to um, what would otherwise remain permanently vacant land uh, to be able to be developed in a nice way uh, that'll be pleasing to the area and the neighborhood. Um, so that, that's actually a really big part of this is bringing together kind of all of those properties into one cohesive design. Um, I wanted to just point out, it has been talked about, that this zone change will reduce the impact to transportation system in the area compared to what could be constructed in the current E1 zoning. And uh, we've done, we hired Chris Clamo. Um, and has done a traffic analysis, and hence the reason for the trip cap of 231 trips to the site. Um, and uh, the nice thing about this is uh, uh, once we explain what we're planning to do here, the, um, the neighborhood was actually quite relieved because of congestion worries with this site if it should ever develop as it currently is. Uh, they were relieved to see that we were uh, proposing to actually have less traffic than what could be there. Could you go to the next slide, please, Jeff? Yeah, so this shows uh, kind of what we're proposing with the E2 zone on the 16.72 acres, uh, the access there to Game Farm, and it also touches the old uh, Covert Road there. Um, and also, I'd like to note um, that this site fronts I-5, which is a quite noisy and uh, rather dirty actually, uh, but major uh, thoroughfare through our state actually. And so our development is actually going to become quite a nice uh, barrier and or buffer uh, for the neighborhood beyond us. Um, we plan to develop the property. Uh, Audi is a very high quality franchise and uh, the buildings are very nice and therefore landscaping, trees, these sorts of things will create nice buffers for our neighbors. Um, our goal is to be a, we want to be a good neighbor. That's why we've reached out so many times to the neighborhood. And uh, our response, once they understood what we were proposing, was actually very positive. I wanted to point out um, a couple of the things regarding Envision Eugene and also uh, the Climate Action Plan. Um, you know, Envision Eugene um, is a state-mandated land use plan that serves as a 
guiding policy document for land use planning, Eugene's urban growth boundary. This particular site is at the very, very edge of the urban growth boundary. I can't point, so it's awkward for me, but uh, I-5 and, yep, there you go. There's the, we said the city boundary and UGB there. That's literally the end where the farthest northeast in the city that we possibly can be. Um, so we're going to be taking a property that is currently underutilized and has been for a very for decades and turning it into an employment uh, center. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was the climate action plan. You know, our our goal here is to create a uh, a facility that has, uh, first of all, with Audi being a, a franchise that is, is growing in its EV uh, production, and as Phil stated, 25% um, uh, by 2025, which will be here before we know it. Um, it. It also is something to think about with 1,200 current Audi customers that currently have to drive 100 miles to get their vehicle serviced outside of the area, those vehicles will be able to stay here, which will drastically help reduce um, uh, traffic and congestion on the highways. I'd like to note also that um, being that this property has sat vacant for quite some time um, and that it is the farthest kind of northeast property in the city of Eugene, uh, it has has been a bit adjacent to across the street where it's agricultural land, numerous homeless camps and fires, which really foster a feeling of not being safe. And I think uh, with this type of development, we're really going to be uh, a good partner in the community to foster a safe environment and um, having eyes and uh, positive development in the area will certainly do that. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out about um, about this is uh, we are planning to create a um, EV charging facility here that would allow um, the public to charge vehicles on site. Um, and by doing that, um, it will create um, you know more eyes, of course, on the property. But it also, we're we're planning and hoping to create a little kind of mini park on the south side of the property that will then connect into the uh, bike paths that are there so that people can take advantage of the tremendous circulation system for uh, PEDS and for bicycles in Eugene. Um, this type of development that we're planning here, um, we, we understand that um, it's, a, it's gonna be a real positive development. Um, this is land that's currently within the urban growth boundary that's been underutilized, like I said, for decades. So we're, we're asking uh, planning commission to please uh, to approve this, um, ask us questions that you may have. We have a whole team here tonight uh, to be able to answer those questions. And um, we're uh, thankful that the planning commission is even considering um, us this evening um, and allowing um, Shepherd Motors to be able to expand, uh, grow jobs in our community and create a real positive uh, development here for the city. So thank you for your time this evening and look forward to answering any of your questions that may come up. Okay, great, thank you, Tim. Um, I'm wondering if there are any commissioners that have questions, I think, um, we can hold them till afterwards, but if we have questions specifically of individuals, feel free to raise your hand and I'll we'll get those asked now. Okay. All right, Amy. Um, we, we, have, have, we have one more attendee with their hand up. Perfect, okay. So I have David Martin. All right, David, uh, you're on. Hi, my name is David Martin, and I am the chair of the Northeast Neighborhood Association, and my address is 3426 Honeywood Street in Eugene, 97408, and I am uh, speaking in support of this development and the proposed changes. Um, I think that this development closely matches the intended purpose of the property originally. And so I think it is consistent with 
uh, you know, the purpose that it was originally designated for. And I would also like to speak, although I'm speaking on behalf of myself today, um, I have heard broad support uh, for this project, this development from uh, other Northeast neighborhood board members, as well as many of the surrounding neighbors. And so I think that uh, this project has the support of the surrounding neighbors. And I think that really makes a difference that, um, that you know, we're cheering it on and we think it will be a great addition to our neighborhood. So I'm very supportive of it and I look forward to seeing it come to pass. Great, thanks, David. Okay, Amy, is there anybody else that was signed up to speak um, on either side, from either side? Nope, that's it. Okay. All right. Um, so I want to just open it up to any other questions of commissioners. Um, anybody didn't look like I had any panelists with the question. Oh, I have uh, Commissioner Ramey. Go ahead. Hi, I have, a, I have a question. I think I know the answer to this question in advance, but the EV charging stations have been mentioned that they're accessible to the public. And there are many EV stations that are associated with businesses that are not actually accessible to the public when the business is closed. And I don't think this is within the realm of land use uh, applications, but it, if there was a way, if it's just like a conditional use permit, we might be able to condition them that on this development, but because it's not, I don't, I don't think we can, but the question to staff is, is there any way that the EV stations, the charging stations can actually be accessible to the public even when the business is not open? Ultimately, um, through land use, we don't have the authority to require that, um, as you said. Uh, however, I would, uh, open it up to the applicant to talk about their proposal a little bit if they want to expand on that because uh, beyond what land use could require. Amy, if you could unmute Tim Brenner, he has his hand up to reply. I think I just did. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I was raising my hand because I'm, it, it's, it's so funny doing these kinds of meetings because we can't see the other people on our team. <laughs> um, and so um, I, this may be something that Phil would like to speak to. So that's why I raised my hand. If you, I don't know if Phil's raised his. <laughs> Thanks. Phil, you've raised your hand. So why don't you go, go ahead. Uh, Amy, if you could unmute Phil. He should be good to have now. Uh, he's showing as muted still. Okay, my fault, sorry. Okay, yeah, we, you know, we want to investigate all of those things. I don't, uh, I don't have specific answers as we're just, you know, in the preliminary process, but what I can tell you about electric vehicles, uh, uh, just from the standpoint of all manufacturers, it's going to be something that, that is going to, to happen. And, and I think we're underprepared uh, in, in, in Eugene in general from the standpoint of being able to charge. And so, you know, our goal is to be able to, to provide uh, something along those lines, what it's going to look like. I'm not quite sure yet, but I think all the manufacturers will have, you know, anywhere from 25 to 50% EV uh, coming in the next three to five and certainly, you know, in the next 10 years. And so, yeah, we're definitely in support of that. But, um, uh, you know, how, how it's going to work, I can't quite tell you yet. And I just wanted to make one quick clarification that um, one of the reasons I had said we don't have the authority and one of the, one of the reasons is just looking at the fact that um, it's looking at these types of the applications that we have in front of us or is what does not give us that that uh, avenue there. So just to clarify. Hey, uh, Commissioner Isaacson, you had your hand up. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Go for it. Thank you. Um, my question relates back to goal 13 on energy conservation. Can the applicant speak to, uh, I know that there's a push to put EV vehicle charging stations in there. Is there any emphasis to um, create the building and sort of lead certifications for the, for the energy conservation of the building itself? 
Um, and then the second is the um, statements from some of the folks who live in the area. One of the common concerns is light pollution. And I don't think that they're speaking to being able to not see the stars, but rather um, large floodlights that, uh, that light the lot um, at night that might cause um, kind of a disruption in their livability. Is there any sort of plan from you guys on uh, how to mitigate that, whether it either be a dimmer switch or motion sensors, something along those lines? Yeah, so uh, the first question regarding uh, uh, lights, you know, the, the, the specifics with uh, LED lights now are, are such where they, they can be directional and then they also can be, as you it indicated, based on motion. And so, you know, ideally we want to save uh, uh, as much power and electricity as we can. And so you know, we're gonna go with, with whatever is the most sophisticated uh, in order to be able to, you know, reduce I guess light pollution uh, is, is what we could call it so that it, it isn't you know worse than what the freeway or the overpass, all the other uh, lights that are currently there. We don't wanna add to that unnecessarily. And then in regards to the facility, uh, again, we have to look at that. Uh, certainly we wanted to, to be a good neighbor and a good partner uh, and, and certainly protect the environment. And so we'll have to, we'll have to look at all those options at this point. And so, um, but uh, yeah, open to everything. Okay, thank you. So Commissioner Brosky, you had a question? Uh, thank you. Um, a, a couple of things, uh, a question and then a comment um, to some of my other commissioners. Um, we're looking at a Metro plan change to a, a designation. We're not looking to the use here. so. You know, to say, are there going to be parking lot lights or not? That's really not. That's really not what we have to look at as our criteria. We have to look at at the uses that will be allowed, and whether it's consistent with the plans that we want to do. This may get built. It may not get built. This is a something that we've had to deal with in the past. You know, we've seen plans, but we're not. We're not. Uh, we're not supposed to look at that when we're, when we're uh, making our decisions. So the approval criteria goes to whatever, uh, you know, it could be a dance studio or whatever is gonna be allowed in this type of zoning. So my, what my question is would be a couple of things. One is, and uh, this will be for deliberations to get from staff. If you could tell me the difference between the um, transition zones, between light, medium industrial and campus industrial and the R2 properties, if there's any difference in setbacks or screening or those types of things. Because to me, the concerns that I saw in the record from the neighbors had to do with those types of things. And those are things that we can deal with and possibly add conditions to if we wanted to. But if I might be wrong about adding conditions or not, but, um, those are the things that I'm going to be looking at to make my decision uh, whether or not it's compatible and if the, the change from campus industrial to light medium industrial is going to be an impact that can be mitigated on the surrounding R2 neighborhood because that was one of the concerns that was brought up for, for me. So staff, if you could bring that when it's time for deliberations, that would be good. Um, and I think for right now, that's my question. I think I had another one, but I forgot what it is. So I'll, I'll loop back. Okay, I don't see any other commissioners that have questions. So I will then uh, find out, does, does the applicant, um, Tim or Bill or anybody uh, wanna chime in with a, any kind of final rebuttal that you have that opportunity at this point? although um, maybe to respond to any of the opposition that you may have seen in the record or anything like that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, that works. Um, yeah, um, just 
you know, a couple of comments, I guess, is, uh, you know, buffering and those sorts of things are all part of the code. So obviously we would need to meet any guidelines that are in the code for any sort of setbacks, um, those sorts of things. So I, I think the, the code is actually, development code is actually really good about providing those sorts of things. And I just wanted to hit on, um, you know, regarding um, the light pollution possibility, that sort of thing. And, and our plan is to um, certainly when we develop this property is as, as Phil mentioned, we're not planning to have any sort of light trespass. There's guidelines and code requirements around that as well that we have to meet. And um, energy efficiency is, is really important too for us so that all the parking lot lighting will be on uh, dimmers, that sort of thing. So I don't think there's, uh, those sorts of things that need to be uh, worried about. If you have any other questions for us, um, we'd be happy to answer those. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, to uh, hearing from you. Okay, great. Um, I do have, I have a, a comment myself, but then I, I do have Mike Reader in the queue. Um, Mike, do you want to go ahead? Good evening, Mike Reeder, for the record, 375 West 4th Avenue, Suite 205, representing the applicant as Land Use Council. Uh, again, want to thank uh, staff for the hard work and the professionalism with which they've proceeded with this application. want to thank Tim and Phil for all their hard work. The only, uh, I guess, response or, or the only thing that I'd like to bring up to the attention of the Planning Commission is something that was discussed a little bit earlier regarding the um, apartments that are uh, adjacent to this particular property. As was mentioned back in 2006, there was a Metro plan, refinement plan and zone change for this property, uh, the, the Stonebridge apartment property, which was uh, campus industrial designated. And so in this particular case, uh, we're asking for a change um, from one industrial designation to another industrial designation, whereas the uh, ward property was uh, a change from a uh, industrially designated and zoned property to a residentially zoned property. So as you weigh and consider and deliberate on this, I'd, I'd like you to keep that in mind. It's a little different than other circumstances where property has historically been uh, designated and zoned uh, uh, a little bit inconsistent with the adjacent property. Uh, and so just keep that in mind and I'd be happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Do commissioners have any questions for Mr. Reader? Okay, I just want to say really quickly, I want to just briefly echo what Commissioner Borofsky said. I do think it's helpful. Um, as he mentioned, you know, our scope uh, is very narrow and it's very specific to evaluating did the applicant meet the criteria um, for this process. And so I just, you know, we, we don't actually have the, the ability to be subjective or decide like we don't, you know, we like this or we don't like this. But I, um, I will say that I think that what would be helpful is some Im information from staff that specifies what is allowable currently in the current designation and what would be allowable in, in E2 or, you know, the, the, the new, uh, uh, the, the proposed uh, zoning, because I do think that that is how, at least for me, I need to look at it. And so when I hear things about lights and parking and traffic and all that, I, I, I want to understand, like, well, what, what, why couldn't that be a current designation? Or why couldn't you put something there that might draw lots of traffic or lights or anything like that? So for me, it's just helpful to kind of understand that um, as I'm thinking about that. So I just kind of want to mention that. And I think if we don't have anybody else, let's see, panelists. Uh, okay, now I have Commissioner Borowski and then Commissioner Ramey. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I remembered my second question. Um, 
So I, I can remember back, unfortunately, I've been on the commission long enough to remember back when we uh, went through the whole campus employment zone uh, for this area. And, and I guess my question is that, again, that staff can bring back to us. You know, when we, when we went through this, it was a fairly robust process uh, of engage, public engagement to, to change it to a, a campus employment zone. Now, now I'm talking about the zone changes. Um, and I guess what I want to know is what has been built since it's been changed from what it was before into the E1 campus employment? Because, you know, it was uh, put out there that this is going to, you know, put a certain type of environment out there. And from what I've seen, I want to know, has the vision that was presented to us back when we did all that work a few years back, has it started to develop that way? Or are we seeing, like has been represented in the record, that it's, it's land is just laying there and not being developed in the, in the way that we thought it was? So if, we, if I could get some sort of an idea of what uh, has been developed in the e E1 campus employment zone in that area, uh, and if if it's working and if or if it's not, because that would help me with my decision as well. Thank you. Yeah, I I would uh, I would agree with that. Um, I'm also let's see, I've got Commissioner Ramey in the queue as well. Hi, right, thanks. Thank you. So along with Commissioner Edwards, my my question originally, and, and Jeff, you started to get to this with your chart, which I didn't have a chance to look at ahead of time, but if you could summarize for us simply the differences between the E1 and the E2, so what would be allowable now that isn't, or if we made the change, what would be allowable that isn't now? So we can sort of evaluate these concerns about, well, it's going to be noisy, it's going to be lighter, you know, not just in a summary fashion, uh, that would be very helpful. Absolutely, and I'll send that out probably uh, right after this meeting. Chair, can Sorry, you I'm ask muted. folks? Yeah, can you ask folks not to use the or remind folks not to use the chat function because we're not able to track that as part of the public record. So if folks want to speak, they need to raise yes, their hand. Yes, I just right. noticed that. So I appreciate that, Alyssa. Uh, yeah. So I want to just remind everybody. I apologize, I didn't mention it um, during the proceedings here, but. Um, the chat function is really hard to capture for the public record. So we're asking folks not to use the chat function. Um, but if if anybody does want to speak uh, on this topic or even submit something in writing, you certainly have that ability. I'll give you a, an opportunity. Um, it looks like one of our attendees may have a, a comment. So I'm just going to give him a few minutes to, or few, a few seconds to see if he would like to say anything for the record. Okay. So seeing none... And no additional panelists, the commissioners having any comments or questions. I am going to close the public hearing uh, and the record as well for this um, for this particular application. Um, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Hold on. I'm backing up here. So the public hearing is closed. I'm going to keep the record open, and at this point, I want to check with staff to find out if there have been any requests to hold the record open. We, we have received no request to hold the record open as of this point. Okay. All right. So at this point, I will then I've closed the public hearing. I'm going to close the record as well. So everything, there will also obviously be an additional opportunity for um, testimony and, and all that uh, when this goes to city council. So I just want to remind everybody of that. So uh, I think that we're going to move on to our second public hearing. So does there need to be a motion to close the record? No. No. I asked that uh, previously, so there does not. you want to hear it from staff to staff <laughs> want to clarify am i right there gabe or jeff that is correct you do not need a formal motion to close the record at this time 
state law does require that it be held open if any participant requests it. And then if that's the case, it would be for seven days, but we have not had such a request. So it's okay to close at this point. So I'm sticking to my original close the record. All right, with that, um, anybody who uh, was here for that hearing, um, you please don't feel like you have to stick around for our next hearing. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start the process for a public hearing on our second item, which is a land use code amendment related to digital signs. I've got new faces popping up now. Um, and I'm not gonna repeat all of that uh, legal jargon uh, for the purposes of this, but I will definitely uh, ask any commissioners if they have any um, ex parte, uh, anything to declare. So I'll go ahead and uh, thank you everybody for attending tonight. We're gonna move on to item number two. Um, we will be considering amendments to the land use code related to digital signs. Um, and so I'm gonna, have city staff just go ahead and introduce yourself real quick. Mike McCurro, associate planner. Mike. Where's Hello. Me? Oh, there you are. Okay. You're and here. I am. Okay, perfect. So we have Mike with us. And then we have Janessa Dragovich. We all know Janessa. And then Lydia K. Janessa is our senior planner. And Lydia K. with Building and Service Perm uh, Permit Services Director. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so we're gonna begin with a presentation with staff and then we'll be opening up a public hearing. Uh, those again, wishing to speak, go ahead and virtually raise your hand. You can do that either either if you're, if you're joining us on a computer, tablet or a smart device, you can raise your hand by clicking the blue icon on the participant uh, window. And if you're on a phone, you can dial star nine and uh, staff will manage that process for us. And so go ahead, if you'd like to speak tonight, please go ahead and do that now. Um, I do wanna ask any commissioners just briefly, if you have uh, any, any declarations, ex parte or bias or conflict of interest that you need to declare. Okay. I have a question, Tiffany. Sure, go ahead, Commissioner it, Is this a quasi-judicial uh, one, this is just legislative, so. That is correct. You're right. I apologize. Uh, this one is legislative, so we don't have the same criteria that applies to this. So I apologize. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, so we don't have to declare those things. Uh, I'm going to start with, we'll start with the staff presentation from Mike, and uh, then we'll go ahead and open the public hearing after that. So Mike, I'm going to throw it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Let's quickly review uh, key information regarding the digital sign code amendment. Last fall, the city council directed staff to amend the sign ordinance to allow digital billboards, digital reader boards, and other changes to clarify the sign standards. So what do we mean when we say digital signs? In addition to the small time and temperature signs you might see at a bank, the two most common current examples of large digital signs include government signs, as well as signs that have obtained a sign variance, usually at an arts or sports venue. The local billboard industry suggested the change to allow current LED technology to be used an example is shown on this slide. I'd like to point out that a sign must be at least 200 square feet in area to be a billboard per the definition. After an initial discussion with billboard industry, staff created a draft ordinance. The proposed changes to the sign standards can be grouped into five categories. The first group is new or altered definitions with clarification sprinkled throughout the code. The second is allowing up to 20 square feet of digital signs for service station use. The third category proposes allowing up to two 40 square foot digital signs for each drive through lane. Category number four allows a 20 square foot digital reader board at institutional uses such as schools, places of worship, and community centers. 
And a final category is allowing conversion of existing billboards to digital billboards. Based on comments from last week's work session, I'd like to show you some examples of institutional signs so you can get an idea of what the code would allow for this specific use. This is the 32 square foot Sheldon High School sign. The digital reader board portion is 22 square feet in area, so it's slightly larger than what the proposed code would allow. This is an example of a slightly smaller high school sign with 26 square feet, of which 16 square feet is a digital reader board. Go Lancers. The most recently installed 4J sign was for Roosevelt Middle School and is only 12 square feet in area. Another example of the largest digital sign allowed under the proposed code is the 32 square foot Hilliard Community Center sign. It has a 20 square foot electronic reader board which matches the proposed code perfectly. And this is an example of a church sign which has a 24 square foot traditional reader board. If replaced with a digital version, the digital portion would need to be slightly smaller at 20 square feet in area. The O'Hara school sign is an example of a smaller portion of the sign area being used for the institution's name. Most of the rest of the sign is reserved for messages. The 24 square foot reader board portion of this sign would be reduced to 20 square feet if it was converted to a digital sign. So the fifth and final category for proposed changes are to allow digital boards in the community and convert those from existing traditional billboards. This map shows the locations of the 120 billboards that are within the city limits currently. Per inquiries from the work session, here are some additional information on legal nonconforming billboards. There are a variety of standards for billboards and approximately 30% of the billboards in the city have at least one legal nonconforming characteristic. The two biggest categories of nonconformities include 14 being too large and 18 being too close to another billboard. The draft code allows a nonconforming billboard to be replaced with a digital version with the same location, height, and size. However, in no case can the new billboard be larger than 300 square feet. Also, any new digital billboard must be at least 1,200 linear feet, about three blocks, from another digital billboard facing the same direction. Other new standards designed to increase compatibility with surroundings are proposed as well. The draft code proposes a 10 second minimum before a message can change. The message can't move. Animation, video, swiping, flashing is not allowed. In addition, an industry adopted glare standard is proposed, which requires auto dimming, especially important at night. This map shows the street classifications of all streets that allow billboards. The draft code allows digital billboards on the longer major arterials shown in green with blue accents. Included are 6th and 7th Avenues, West 11th Avenue, part of Beltline Road, Highway 99, part of Coburg Road, a portion of I-105, Franklin Boulevard, and a small part of I-5. This is the end of our presentation. Okay. So does, do we have any uh, com commissioners? Oh, I do see Commissioner Fregla does have a question of staff. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let these questions, actually, let me think here. 
Yeah, we'll go ahead and let uh, some questions be answered and then I'll open the public hearing. So go ahead, Commissioner Fragla, you have a question. Um, I just wanted to ask that if we could receive that slideshow, it would be much appreciated. Absolutely, I can send it to you after the meeting. Okay, do we have any other questions before I go ahead and open up the public hearing? Okay, now I would like to open up the public hearing. If you'd like to speak and have not already raised your hand, you can do so now. And I'm gonna have, um, I'll have, I'll have Amy um, call on our um, folks that are signed up to testify. So go ahead, Amy, who do we have? So we have Brian Cassidy. Okay, Brian? Go ahead, and uh, I think Amy can unmute you if you'd like to speak. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Brian Cassidy, 732 East 19th Street in the Dalles, Oregon. Um, I understand Janessa and I are going to coordinate on flipping through the uh, brief PowerPoint that I sent earlier. Um, so Chair Edwards, members of the commission, thank you for your opportunity, for this opportunity to speak to you. I'm with Meadow Outdoor Advertising. We're an Oregon-based family-owned billboard company with a presence in Eugene, and I'm speaking on behalf of Eugene's billboard industry. I wanna take a few moments to express my appreciation for the work staff has done so far on the topic of digital signs for Eugene to provide some background about digital billboards in Oregon and to provide a few comments from the billboard industry about the draft code presented last week by staff. So next slide, please. Uh, in 2011, the Oregon State Legislature approved digital billboards for Oregon. They are regulated based on size, no larger than 672 square feet, location uh, on commercial or industrial land, brightness, no more than 0.3 foot candles over ambient light, no less than a eight second dwell time, Spacing is the same as for conventional billboards, which inside the city is 100 feet. Uh, and permitting, uh, they are permitted only on signs with a state-issued outdoor advertising sign permit. There are several other requirements in the state code, such as using renewable resources uh, to power the signs when available, uh, which are not included on this list. But this provides a quick overview for comparison's sake. So I'm gonna skip the next slide, Janessa, in the uh, interest of time. And moving on to uh, Eugene's draft code contains some similar elements to the state code, but adds a few additional elements to meet Eugene's existing code and specific needs. So Eugene's draft code proposes size no larger than 300 square feet, location on some major arterials, brightness not more than 0.3 foot candles over ambient light, Dwell time, no less than 10 seconds, spacing of uh, 1,200 feet, and permitted only on legally placed signs. Um, and now to borrow from Mike McCarrow's dinner analogy from last week, uh, the main course of my presentation, the billboard industry appreciates staff process and engagement. Oh, so let's go to the next slide, Dina, so sorry. Um, we appreciate staff's process and engagement with stakeholders. We're in agreement with staff on most of the proposed code elements. There are a few changes that the industry proposes and has discussed with staff. Uh, the first is location. Uh, we'd like to propose that they be allowed on all major arterials. Dwell time, no less than eight seconds, which is the national standard. To clarify on spacing, that 1,200 uh, foot spacing is for signs facing the same direction and to address a claim jumping concern that was raised by uh, Commissioner Borowski last week, we have proposed to staff a city managed permit process for an even distribution of signs along major arterials and between the companies. So that concludes my comments. Thank you for your time. And I and my colleagues are available to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, do I have any questions from commissioners, either of staff or of Brian? Okay, I do have, I have another attendee that looks like that they have raised their hand. 
Amy, do you wanna? Yeah, we have James Carpenter. Okay, perfect. James, uh, go ahead and if Amy can unmute you, you're welcome to speak. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay, okay. great. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, James Carpentier address is 215 Ridge Trail Drive, Sedona, Arizona. And I'm here in support of the signed code amendment. And we do have uh, a few suggestions. Uh, Chair Edwards and the Planning Commission, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, here on behalf of the Northwest Sign Council and International Sign Association representing the on-premise sign industry, even though the state of Oregon's, Oregon's constitution does not recognize that we do. So that's just uh, for clarification. As I said, we're, we're supportive of uh, the expansion of the digital signs for institutional uses. We think that is uh, a great great thing to do and I think the staff has done a good job and addressed all the, the uh, issues that comes along when it comes to regulating electronic message centers or digital signs. Um, one thing that we'd like to request and you've got a letter that basically states the same thing but I'm just going to state it again. We respectfully request that the Planning Commission recommend to Council that digital or electronic message centers be allowed with reasonable standards in commercial, industrial, and employment districts. So why do we re recommend this? Uh, number one, given these unbelievably challenging economic times, we believe that additional flexibility in messaging for customers has taken on a heightened importance. In these unprecedented times, small businesses really need the options such as EMCs to enable effective and immediate communication with customers uh, and the community. Number two, in addition, this technology can provide PSAs for disasters, emergencies, uh, and amber alerts. Number three, EMCs have been demonstrated to economically support and enhance local businesses as indicated in the case study, which uh, you previously received. It's uh, economic value of science studies done um, a few years ago, which ha just happened to be a car dealer, which you were talking about earlier in your previous public hearing. And number four, to allow digital billboards up to 300 square feet, and then on the other hand, limit EMCs to only three square feet or almost uh, really kind of ban them in commercial, industrial, and employment districts is we believe is not equ equitable or supportive of the local business community. Therefore, we request that the Planning Commission recommend to the Council to allow electronic message centers or digital signs in commercial, industrial, and employment districts with standards proposed similar to those um, for institutional uses. And that is it. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a couple of commissioners in the queue with, I'm guessing, some questions. So I'll just go in order of the hands raised here. I have Commissioner Borowski followed by Commissioner Ramey. Thank you. Um, I guess this, would, again, would be a question from for staff to, for information to be brought back for deliberations. Um, some of the uh, proposals that are being put forward by the applicant, by the industry, um, I, I don't, I think are, are well reasoned. The eight seconds as opposed to 10 seconds, uh, you know, if it's an industry standard and best practices, I don't have any problem with that. Um, front and back facing the the distance between I think that's that's a clarification uh, the, the the question that I do have and what I would like to hear from staff is they're asking it to be available on all well two different things one the the first ask was from the our first presenter was to have it on all arterials and uh, it, throughout the city um, 
and then the second one was in all industrial and commercial areas. Um, I would like to know what type of, uh, how many more billboards would that be, and this would just be a stab, but using the 1200 foot uh, barrier, how many more proliferation of billboards would we see if we, if we went with that? And then the second question I had was, um, is the, was the, I remember watching the council or be attending the council uh, meeting on this. Um, was there more than one or was there one? And then they directed it at that one. Cause I'd like to go back and watch the council's uh, questions and concerns uh, so that I can keep those in mind when I'm deliberating this to see if I'm going to be consistent with what I heard at the council meeting. So if you could let me know the dates of the council meetings that were, uh, that were, I know that the no, September 9th was when it was recommended, but there may have been a work session before that. So if there was, I'd like to know that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Commissioner Borowski. Uh, next I have Commissioner Ramey followed by Commissioner Fragla. Okay, great, thank you. I have two questions. Uh, one, we've, we've been told uh, many times or several times anyway, that there's no way to legislate the content of the signs. So we can't really direct what anybody puts on the sign. So I have a slightly a different question. I think I, I'm gonna end up in the same place, but my question is more about the, the PSAs, the Amber Alerts, the warnings. Is there is there a possibility that rather than the content, we could actually talk about uh, access in terms of time? So in other words, if, if the sign was up and running for 12 hours a day, if there could be a certain amount of that time that then was dedicated for this kind of amber PSA of warning. So we're, we're, not, we're not limiting the content, we're talking about how the time is scheduled on the sign. Um, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know if that's a fine enough point, I, I, uh, I fear the worst, uh, but that might be a way, so what I'm worried about is that there isn't actually any, there's a lot of good talk about what well, we'll do PSAs, we'll do amber warnings, but there's nothing in the code that actually requires that or even creates the mechanism for it. So it's possible that that would not happen. And I think that's an opportunity that, that we really, we don't wanna pass on. Uh, my second question then is, um, if we could have, I noticed the solar, the renewable, I don't necessarily think it should be solar, but renewable power is a state standard, it sounds like. And if that's some way we could add that to ours, then the industry could choose whether they wanna do solar or just buy renewable power from the local providers. I think that that's something to look into. I don't know if there's an economic um, effect to that that would be burdensome to the industry, but certainly asking the question would be good. So thank you. Okay, Janessa, do you have any response to that before I go to the other commissioners with questions? Yeah, I'd like to respond to a couple of things real quick. And just to uh, Commissioner Borowski's comment, I will include the link to the September work session for council when I send out the PowerPoint slides for tonight's so that you have that really easily to get back to. Um, in terms of the, the time, um, the question of can we require a certain percentage of time devoted to public service announcements or AMBRO alerts, the city can't really require a percentage of, of time that way because it's still in, a, in an indirect way getting at um, regulating content. So um, in doing so, we would have to monitor them and, and look at the content in order to determine whether they were putting enough of the, of the public service announcements in there. And so it really is still kind of coming back around to being a content-based regulation, which is, is not, um, not something that we can do. Um, and I'm not sure I totally uh, caught the the second part, Commissioner Ramey, of your um, comment on the power and the and the state requirement. Um, I think I heard that the state was uh, part of their code included renewable energy. So the I think I heard that, and whether we could do that as well. That's something that we'll definitely have to look into. I know um, Commissioner Isaacson had brought up the that um, 
possibility at the work session last week, and that's something that we'll need to check out. Uh, I'm not super optimistic that we could regulate that or require that, um, but we'll we'll get a more definitive answer on that before we deliberate. Okay, thank you, Janessa. Um, I do have Commissioner Fragala followed by Commissioner Isaacson. Great, thank you. Um, so I did have a clarifying question about the uh, map that's currently on the screen. So did you only indicate the major arterials on this map that have billboards or are all major arterials in the urban development area indicated? That's a good uh, question, uh, Commissioner Fragula. Um, what we have showed here are all of the portions of major arterials that are listed as allowing billboards in our current sign code. So, so I, there's portions of Beltline that are, are not listed for billboards that are a major arterial. So we started with the list um, in our current code that allows billboards. And so each one or portions of those streets that are major arterials are shown in green. And then we have included the blue accents for the major arterials, which we are proposing to allow digital billboards. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess what I'm trying to understand and um, it would be helpful to have this information when we deliberate is the same question that Commissioner Borofsky asked is um, the language that the plant, the planning department is recommending is some major arterials. And um, my understanding of what you just said is that you have shown the sum on this map because what the planning department is suggesting won't change essentially where the billboards will be allowed. However, the request by the industry is that we change it to all major arterials. And so I would like to have information um, that shows me what that would mean. What would all major arterials represent? I love a visual and I'm also interested in the information that um, about what the proliferation would look like um, similar to Commissioner Borofsky. Um, I had a second question, and that is a clarification about the intent of the city council. Um, based on information that was communicated to us in our work session, it was my understanding that the city council was directing us not to, to dramatically change the sign code, but they had given us a very narrow um, reference for what they wanted the planning department and planning commission to work on. So could I have clarification on that? And I would also like to follow up by viewing the meeting. So thanks for that link. So I'll um, jump in here. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to mention that, but um, the, the council poll that was originally done um, was specifically getting at the digital, bill, allowing digital billboards. And as part of that, it was brought up and mentioned as part of the poll, the Churchill High School Electronic Message Center that, that we showed you in the presentation tonight. Um, there, were, there was a little bit of um, confusion when that, when that sign came through. And we kind of are working with a workaround on those institutional signs now. But this the, the way that we've drafted the code would provide clarity and, and um, the actual radio, you know, put some better parameters on those signs to allow what we know has already been um, occurring, but, but under not as clear code um, allowance. So that's why our, our code changes are really focused on the, the digital billboard allowance and the, the institutional signs and didn't, we didn't go there to open them up for commercial and industrial as, as mentioned and requested by the industry. So that's definitely a policy question or issue that 
that um, you can you can discuss at deliberations in terms of what you want to make a, as a recommendation to council. Um, the we can certainly provide a, a map, a contrasting map that shows all of the major arterials. This does show there are some um, existing roadways that aren't ma major arterials that allow traditional billboards. So those are the yellow and orange. There's a tiny little bit of a red local um, street here. So with the digital billboards, um, staff wanted to be responsive to some of the concerns that we heard from council counselors when we went to the work session. A couple of the counselors were curious about whether we could put a cap on the number of digital billboards in Eugene. And so in part, our recommendation as it is here uh, uh, with a subset of the major arterials is in response to that. It, it's trying to kind of find a, find a elegant way to regulate the signs, allow them, but not necessarily open them up um, for other areas of Eugene. And um, we really wanted to avoid putting a cap on the numbers within Eugene as a whole. That would be more difficult to, for us to regulate and um, to, to you know, implement it from a, from a staff perspective. So that's that's kind of why you've got this as the starting point. And again, this is a policy level decision that you guys, you um, as a commission can discuss when we deliberate and see what you feel comfortable making the recommendation to council. Um, I think l watching that council work session will be really helpful in terms of getting a better idea of the support on council and, and the direction that they gave us. But you are correct at the work session last week, we did try to point out the narrowness of the scope that they gave us. And, and we really tried to stay true to that and only recommend changes that, that were providing really needed clarity in the existing sign code and, um, and that addressed the, the, the two kind of subsets of digital signs that they were specific about digital billboards and the institutional signs. Great, thank you so much, Janessa. All right, I'm gonna to go to Commissioner Isaacson followed by Commissioner Beeson. So my question relates to page 79 of our agenda packet. Um, it's the information we got from industry. Um, this is a question for staff and we can have that for deliberations. They talk about safety and the last paragraph that the throughput square allowance and the five picker limitation is not reasonable. The size of render the EMC is not safely viewable and legible. So if we could have some clarification on what we've come up with as it the sign is or um, uh, safe and from from our perspective uh, or is not and that we can have that for deliberation and then also on the next page on 80 they are suggesting that the content could still be viewed potentially as as uh, we're regulating content on uh, service stations um, uh, having a uh, a viewing limit of how often we change the content um, per day. So in other words, if we're allowing, if we're only saying one per day, then there could be a challenge there. So I'm wondering if they're suggesting they could challenge on 1A grounds, like First Amendment grounds. So that would be something I want to know from staff as to what their viewpoint is um, uh, regarding those two issues. We'll look into that and come back for deliberations. I don't think that's those are questions that we can answer right now tonight. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Commissioner Beeson, followed by Commissioner Borowski for a second round. Thank you. Um, first off, I, I did watch the uh, council meeting, and I, I, I hear people are going to watch. I definitely recommend it. I, I came away from that um, understanding that their their request and in fact their motion is very narrow. That's been remarked on a couple of times, uh, but it is helpful to watch it. Uh, I have kind of the same request that's been made a couple of times. I want to add to it a little bit. I, I heard as the industry reps were talking, they were uh, asking that uh, we add a few things to, to uh, the staff draft amendment, one of which was the uh, all major arterials. Uh, there were, I think, a couple of other things. So I think what I would be looking for when you come back is uh, all, all the stuff that's been asked for at this point. I'd like to see where where are the arterials and how would that kind of differ from what we have now. 
Um, I'm, I'm also interested in staffs, and you probably would do this in any event, but just to say it out loud, uh, I'd be real interested in staff's recommendation on that, uh, how we approach that or how that, it, to the extent you begin to change the amendment we were looking at last week, um, your recommendations on that. And then if you could show us or provide to us uh, anything else they were asking for that differs from the amendment and uh, the draft amendment and what your thoughts are about that. Thanks. I do want to respond. Um, I was going to say this before, but there's two of the two of the four items that Brian had um, listed on the one uh, PowerPoint that is pretty easy for us staff to respond to. The eight second dwell time is not a problem. Staff has no problem supporting that change from eight from ten seconds down to eight seconds. Um, those were kind of the two most common numbers that that had um, that we had come across in our research. So that one I think is is an easy one to say that staff supports. The other, um, it was more of a clarification. It was our intent to make the 1200 foot, foot separation for signs facing the same direction. So that is another change that, that is um, really easy for us to say we agree and, and, and are happy to make that change. The other two um, items, I will come back and follow up at deliberations with a better response on, on how we, how we um, what our opinions are on that. All right, I'm gonna go to my last commissioner with his hand up, uh, Commissioner Borofsky. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of clarifications. Um, in the work set, we, re we removed a couple of areas that were permitted before, um, but there was, I think, one on Garfield or something like that where, where it was allowed and we decided that that wasn't one that was appropriate to be allowed. Um, and so I guess one of my questions is, are there other areas that we could say we want to limit? Because when I, when I, my recollection of the, of the city council's uh, work session was they saw that this was a, an emerging technology and something that, that would fit in with our with our things, but they didn't want a proliferation of more billboards in the city. And so, you know, they were like, okay, if you've got a billboard now, we're okay with it changing to a digital one, but we don't want, a, you know, I think the separation thing got to some of what council was hoping for. Um, so to me, if if there's other parts of this green map that we could limit it. So like right now I see Highway 99 goes all the way out to the UGB. Could we bring that back to the last, the last, uh, you know, billboard that's there? Um, same thing with West 11th. Could we, could we, sh you know, shorten our green area so that we're not having proliferation of these um, yet we're still allowing the existing billboards to transform into the the digital billboards, and so that would be something that I would be interested in in just diving into further. And then the other thing that I would like to know is uh, industry proposed that the I'm I'm calling it the draft lottery uh, approach. And if you could if you could put out what their proposal is for being able to get into queue so that there's not a big land rush. You know, we don't want the Oklahoma Sooners of, of uh, billboards happening in our community. Uh, so they said that they had come up with some sort of a plan, but they didn't allude to what that plan was. And so I'd like to know that, and if that is something that staff could, could buy into or, or give us some input on that as well. Thank you. 
So on the map here, um, you bring up a good point of clarification on this. So this darker gray area are, is the city limits. These are properties that are annexed. This lighter gray out here that's within the UGB, but um, but not in the city limits. So these stand, these rules would apply only to annex properties within the urban growth boundary. So for instance, these billboards that are out here, um, well, depending on, on these right here, because they're next to annex property, but, it's, but several of these would not be able to be converted to digital billboards yet because the um, urbanizable land code still applies out there and not the city code, which is where, where these regulations are going to um, live. That said, upon annexation, that's future capacity that, that would become available unless you, we limited and changed the segment where we allowed that. To your to your point, yes, you absolutely have the ability to recommend to council where, you know, any of those kind of adjustments to where they're allowed. We can we can write it in similar to how the existing um, list is within code, um, the street segment. So on these streets between this intersection and this intersection, that is completely up to you to. Um, kind of tailor that to, to what meets your recommendation. And I'll uh, just go ahead and share a clarification since it's come up with several of the counselors. Uh, commissioners, sorry, you just got promoted. Um, so with uh, Janessa's help, uh, the connection between um, 6th and 7th and 11th is Garfield Street. We are not proposing in the code at this time to have digital billboards there. What we did, we chose the kind of traditional longer length um, arterials, but there are some shorter streets that actually have enough traffic that have the major arterial classification. Garfield is the first one. And then just east of downtown, Mill Street between Broadway and 6th Avenue, um, we don't even think of it as Mill Street necessarily, but that north-south section is another one. And then going east from there on Broadway until Franklin. Those are three major arterials based on traffic volume uh, that are probably not thought of as arterials to a lot of people in the community, but those are not currently included and um, it's my understanding that the billboard industry would like to include those. And then before uh, deliberations, we'll confirm with them if they're talking of uh, any other portions of any other streets. But that includes you know, all the green is where billboards are allowed now. So um, that may be the limitation of what they're asking to include. And I'm not sure if now's a good time, if there's one of the industry representatives that could speak to the other part of your question, Commissioner Borofsky, around the, the kind of lottery system or, or um, if, they've, if they want to explain a little bit more what systems they've encountered that work well in terms of equitable distribution of, of the locations. Yeah, so I'd be I'd welcome that right now, or I'd, I'd also want to because I, I we we are still on the public hearing component, which is fine. Um, it sounds like Brian might be willing to chime in. Um, well, yeah, let's just do that. Brian, do you want to go ahead and chime in on that? Yeah. Um, so on page sixty six of your handout is what we have outlined as kind of the process for. Uh, how we would manage the uh, the land rush, Oklahoma Sooners, uh, and basically uh, what we're presenting here is the the billboard industry in Eugene is uh, uh, made up of a couple uh, national advertising companies, um, uh, our company, which is the uh, family-owned Oregon-based company, and then a few individual operators um, and we've kind of put our heads together and said let's figure out what makes sense for all of us uh, in terms of so that we're not a you know diminishing each other's value on the signs by having them too close together which you know the staff has has managed that with the 1200 foot spacing which is great um, 
And then uh, how do we find kind of an equitable solution so we're not camping for a month on uh, um, the planning department's uh, doorstep uh, waiting to apply. And so this is what, what we've come up with where uh, these we actually spell out the particular billboards that uh, each of the industries, uh, each of the representatives in the industry would like to uh, to move forward with digitizing if and when the, the amendments are made. Uh, so it, I believe there's, uh, is it 10 total there? Um, and that uh, basically each company would, there's three for each of the major companies and then, and then one for uh, the uh, smaller operators that are outlined there. And we would basically look to staff to uh, to manage that process. Okay. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to go ahead and if there aren't any other questions um, just for at the moment that need to be a part of the record. I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, but I am going to, I think we discussed this uh, with staff last week, and I think it made sense to keep the record open. Uh, we talked about an August 4th date, which would allow the, the commission to have plenty of time before deliberations, but would still let folks, um, you know, uh, enter anything else into the record that they feel is relevant. So I think that we will go ahead and do that. Um, if Janessa or Mike want to correct me, I think that, that that seems to make sense. I'm seeing head nods. I'll just add real quick to th no, yeah, please. that um, because this is a legislative process, the record um, does not close and it's going to stay open and t through the council adoption process. So the reason for the August 4th date was to try to find a, find a time to allow a little bit more time for more information and testimony to come in if anybody wants to in response to the public hearing, but also give time so that we can get that information added to the packet that we'll be posting on the 4th for your August 11th deliberation. And so it's, it's kind of a soft deadline. Um, this, it, okay. Anything through we will continue to keep it's just kind of our shut off so that you, so the planning commission has a finite set of of testimony that they're um, considering for their recommendation to council and then anything that comes in after that fact we will definitely provide that to council. okay okay perfect so we'll I, so we did that i went i closed the the hearing i do have commissioner broski in the queue yeah the Thank you for the uh, explanation on the, the draft lottery. I guess my question on that would be, and, I, and this is something that I'll have staff check with, um, with legal on this, because I mean, the way that you just presented it, it kind of sounded like it was, uh, you know, we're the good old boys and we're going to split it up the way that we want. And does that uh, lock out any new uh, players into the digital or uh, media market in the in the city of Eugene, you know if if these if these locations are preordained and somebody else a new player wants to come into town, are we uh, are we prohibiting a fair playing field for the market economy? Uh, so I, I think you need to run that by legal and see if that's something that would be uh, allowed or is this a is this a, a collusion type of a thing? Uh, I'm not a lawyer, obviously, but if I wanted to get into the billboard uh, industry, it seems like these these ten signs would be locked up, plus 1,800 or 1,200 feet either way of these signs would be locked up. So we're limiting. Uh, we're limiting competition. And I don't know if that's something that we can do, that we can codify. So I don't know if this is the, the correct way to get at what we're looking for. Um, this is one area that was was presented by, by the players that are in the market right now, but it may not be the players that are gonna be in the market in a year or two or five. And this is a codified uh, 
thing and they're talking about five years out. So I think that we definitely need to run this by our legal department before we think about adopting it. All right, thank you for those comments, Commissioner Borowski. Um, well, certainly, I would imagine staff will follow up and um, make sure we have everything that we need for deliberations. In the meantime, if you have any questions, I would say, you know, reach out to Janessa or Mike um, and make sure that you have everything you need for deliberations, which will be tentatively scheduled for August 11th, 5.30 p.m., but we'll wait to see uh, the official agendas come out before we um, officially <laughs> officially uh, nail us down to those dates. So if there's nothing else, is there anything else from staff or any other commissioners that have comments or questions? Just, I have a real quick comment that you do have a planning commission meeting on Monday, August 3rd at yeah. 11 30 and so yeah. on that um agenda will be the shepherd motors your first meeting for deliberations and action hopefully um and that'll be the first half of the meeting and then even if even if you don't finish we're only gonna we're gonna limit that to half the meeting and then there will be a work session on urban reserves and then both of those will come back again on the 17th yeah. all right sounds good thank you Alyssa Oh, Commissioner Ramey, I see a blue oh, hand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just quickly, I won't, I won't be here on the 3rd of August. So just letting you know that now. I think you'll be okay quorum-wise, but I will be absent. And just just uh, for future planning, um, and and this is, again, it, it's conflict of interest for me, but... Um, the eWeb board meets on the first or the second Tuesday of each month, and that's something that I kind of got myself into. <laughs> so um, there may be times in the future. I mean, obviously, I'm not I'm not uh, on the board yet, but I will be once I get on the board. That would probably take a priority over a Tuesday night planning commission meeting for me. Just a heads up. And you said that was the first or the second Tuesday, I'm sorry. The second Tuesdays of each month is what it is. And we switched our, you know, day and night meetings type of deal. So just uh, just a heads up. And there, I think there's only going to be an overlap of maybe six months or something like that. But I just wanted to let people be aware that I'm not, I, I still love all you guys and I want to be a part of it, but I've got conflicting priorities. Okay. Well, and maybe we can work on doing some doodle polls or whatnot just to make sure we have enough folks that can be present at, at the meetings. And All right. Well, thank you all. I really appreciate everybody. Um, staff, thank you guys for hanging in there. And thank you all for bearing with me with my 20 pages of scripts over here. So I apologize for, uh, for ad-libbing. Uh, anyway. I'm gonna let you all go. Have a wonderful evening. We're gonna, with that all, I'm gonna adjourn us.